Good afternoon, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started so we can get out of here before six o'clock tonight. Just, just kidding. I'll be out. I'll be done in like 45. Um, my name is Sergeant Chris Bishop with the Utah Air Patrol. Um, I'm going to talk to you a lot about the graduated driver's license and a few other things that, that we encounter, uh, some things that, that we can do, and some things that we're working on with zero fatalities right now. Um, for the first part, I'm probably not going to teach you guys anything that you don't already know. Uh, you're very familiar with the GDL laws, uh, what they what they do, but hopefully there's something that uh, that we can pull out of it that uh, you may go, oh, that's kind of important, kind of kind of good to know. Um, I love interaction, so if you have questions or comments, let's hear them. Because uh, if not, I just get bored of hearing my own my own self talk for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm really I'm happy to to be be down here. I'm uh, grateful for uh, Audra to, uh, for inviting me down um, to to speak to you, and hopefully we'll learn something and we'll uh, be better instructors out of it. So what is the the GDL? Again, something that you should all know. Um, probably isn't going to be anything surprising, but it's uh, basically uh, three different things. Um, or, Categorized in uh, in three different ways. First, it's the the learning air the learning phase that we have the permitting process. Uh, next is the provisional license, and then finally the the full license. Uh, it was adopted in the 90s uh, nationwide, and Utah adopted it in 1999. Uh, we we found that it's successful, and we'll we'll talk about those stats here a little bit later. But why it is that we have a, a GDL program. All 50 states have some form of the, the GDL, although the state regulations may vary uh, from state to state, but they're all going to encompass the permitting process, uh, some sort of provisional license, and then moving to a full license. Um, Utah's laws are primarily for the 15 to 17 year olds. Uh, once you turn 18 and, and 19, those restrictions aren't, aren't quite as uh, prevalent. So we were all uh, new drivers at one time. So I have to get out of here to watch this video because for some reason it's not working. So again, we were all new drivers at, at one at one point. Um, you, as instructors, probably um, feel those parents. Uh, my oldest is he'll be 11 in June, and a few months ago he's like, "Dad, why can't fifth graders drive?" Um, so Tucker, well, I think the main reason is you can't see over the steering wheel, but uh, that and you're in fifth grade. That's that's really the the key there. You are, are way too young to process all that information that that comes into you while driving but uh, we have to remember that we were once teens we may have made some stupid mistakes once or twice in our, our lives but uh, we had to see them you know these parents i'm like oh man my time is my time is coming it's uh just a few more years till till i get to be in that passenger seat but um, prior to uh, moving to our headquarters doing what i do now uh, I spent uh, almost four years as a field training officer, so I sat in the passenger seat of brand new troopers. Um, and let me tell you, there's nothing more uh, exhilarating is not the the right word. Um, 
eye opening, I guess, than uh, sitting in the passenger seat as you're uh, sitting in, or doing a high speed pursuit with a, a brand new trooper. Not not the most comfortable situation in the world, but so I, I, I feel these people, but I don't have a, a brake pedal when I, I sit in the passenger seat. Um, so it's just hanging on for, for dear life. But here's the, the Utah GDL um, regulations. 15, 16, 17, they all pretty much have the, the same uh, regulations. 17 year olds don't have, um, or sorry, 18 year olds don't have to hold the permit for six months like the 16, 17 year old, 15, 16, 17 year olds do. And then 19 year olds are not required to do driver's training at all, as long as they can prove that they've done the 40 hours with the 10 hours at night. Um, but I would highly, highly encourage them to, to still do it. Uh, I think there's valuable knowledge that's gained through driver's education. And I'd, I'd hope that each of you would, would probably agree with that. Uh, on this um, page, um, we see that the nighttime restrictions are uh, cease at 17. So 17, 18, 19 do not have to um, worry about driving between uh, 12 and 5 a.m. Um, and the other thing that I, I want to bring up that a lot of kids will ask, well, can I drive with my cousins? You know, they're, they're family. Cousins are our family. And there's also cousins and uncles and aunts, but uh, they're not family. Uh, for the purpose of the GDL law, it's immediate family only that are able to be in the car. So a couple other uh, regulations that, that we talk about. Cell phone use is prohibited under uh, 18 years old, and that's any cell phone use, even Bluetooth in the car is, is a, a no-go. Um, of course, there's those emergency situations, um, but those are limited to emergency situations, not, hey, mom, I forgot my, uh, my lunch today. Can you bring it? That's not an emergency. An emergency is, holy cow, there's a crash or something is happening that you need to call 911. That's an emergency, not what other kids think might be an emergency. Uh, the not a drop law, is also a real big deal um, in Utah. If I can smell it on uh, a juvenile's breath, that's enough uh, for us to to go down that path. Uh, we don't necessarily have to have open containers or or any other testing. We will do all that, uh, just like any other DUI investigation. But as long as as we can smell it, they're in violation of the the not a, not a drop law. Uh, that'd be under 21, because anyone under 21 is an alcohol restricted driver in Utah. Um, so right now, uh, if I were to go out and stop uh, a young person for violating those GDL laws, I can give them a ticket. Um, they will go to court and the judge will say, well, there's no fine associated. There's no points associated with, with that, uh, that violation. And so it's kind of disheartening because we want to, to keep these kids accountable, but, uh, but there's no teeth behind, behind those laws. And so we're currently working with the Teen Driver Task Force uh, to see if that's something we want to address in uh, an upcoming legislative session to see if, if that's something we want to do. Um, a lot of other states do. Utah is one of the very few that, uh, that does not have any penalties associated with uh, the GDL law violations. Um, next month, I'll be uh, speaking at the Department of Public Safety's Public Safety Summit, uh, addressing why, why it is that we need, still need to enforce it. And really, it's, it's about accountability. Um, we have these laws, and these laws are meant to, to protect these kids. Um, we, we may not have the, the teeth behind them right now, but we still want to enforce them. I was able to pull stats uh, from just the Highway Patrol uh, going back to 2016, and we're averaging about 500 um, GDL violations per year that we're, we're enforcing. I think that's on the law enforcement side, it's very under, uh, underutilized that a lot of law enforcement don't know about it and they're not enforcing it. So that's what I'll be addressing next month is why we, why it is that we need to address it even though there's no, uh, violations behind it or penalties behind it. Yes, sir. That's, uh, that's different and um, that's possible. Um, the insurance may see it on the driving record because they still did pull over and uh, cited for it. So that may be an issue, but uh, as far as the driver's license points, it's not a moving violation and they are not assessing points to it um, yet. That's like, one thing we're 
probably looking towards maybe not necessarily making it an infraction, but still making it some sort of a moving violation that will have points attached to it. But that's a, a great question because insurance, they can make you do other things that the law may not just because they're the ones that are going to be paying for it. But really, it also comes down to getting parents and guardians involved. Um, we'll talk about that as well, how important that that really is to have these parents involved in, in, theirs, in these kids' lives. Uh, but more, most importantly, uh, these laws save lives. Um, when we instituted the, uh, the GDL laws, teen deaths have gone down 70% as far as uh, motor vehicle crashes have, are concerned. That's, that's a really, really big number. Uh, unfortunately, we're seeing a little bit of, bit of an uptick the last couple of years um, over, over these things. And it's just kids going out and, and driving and not having that parental involvement saying, hey, you can't drive with your friends right now, wait. And, you know, again, we were all kids once. We want to ha we have that freedom, but we got to we got to take those those steps. Um, when I do my driver's ed presentations, I talk about, you know, the, the human brain, and how teens do not have fully developed brains. Um, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to make poor decisions. That's part of life. But that's also what why we have driving training. That's why we have these kind of educational opportunities to hopefully mitigate some of the mistakes they're gonna they're gonna make, provide them with uh, proper training so they can fall back on that training instead of, hey, this sounds like it's gonna be a lot of fun, let's do that. Um, but uh, a few months ago, say it's back November or December, we had a pretty rough stretch of, of teen deaths uh, right at the end of 2021. And uh, I was sitting in my office and Colonel Rapich the Ohio Patrol came in and said, hey, Chris, man, what's going on with all these teens? We are, we are losing a lot of teens. Um, I said, yeah, it's, it's getting really bad. He said, we need to do something about it. I said, yeah, I agree, Colonel, we, we need to do something about it. So he left, and then he came back in a few, uh, few minutes later. He said, we need to do something today. I'm like, okay. So he told me, he's like, I want you to come up with a plan. I'm going to a meeting. I'll be back uh, this afternoon, and uh, we're going to talk about it. I said, okay. So I called... Um, my my friends over at the highway safety office said hey, i need some stats on some some teen deaths uh and then i called uh, zero fatalities said stacy i need some help you know what can we do to to get this messaging out and so she sent me to the chop uh, website the children's hospital of philadelphia that is a fantastic website if you if you aren't familiar with it head to the zero fatalities website they uh, do a lot of uh, they use a lot of their information and link to the chop website it is awesome information so i'm looking through it looking through it and i found the answer it was parental involvement i'm like holy cow there it is um if parents are involved teens are a whole lot safer not just behind the wheel but in life in general uh, when we have parental involvement that's how how we save teens lives so colonel rapich came back and he said okay chris what do you got i said we need to we need to hit the parents uh, we need to get them active in in their kids lives he said okay so we came up with messaging and we're ready to get it out that afternoon then he came back and said let's let's hold off let's not hit the parents uh, too hard quite yet but uh but that's the the solution and i know that's a really really hard solution because everybody has lives we're more busy now than we've ever been with all sorts of things going on but when it comes down to it it's getting parents involved so sorry that's a really big paragraph but basically what it says is gdls save lives um, these restrictions on nighttime activities, uh, nighttime driving, and teenage passengers, they save lives. And because this was done by the Insurance Institute, they also wanted to make sure that it also reduces insurance losses. So, like I said, the biggest factor in teen driving success is parental involvement. Um, we have the, the parent nights um, where they, they come in, they get to learn about all these things, but it's, and it's not necessarily your job as driving instructors, as driver's ed teachers to, to get parents involved. That's something that has to go back to the, the fundamentals, but encouraging parents to be involved. You know, they're gonna sign off on those 40 hours, but, you know, and really trying to do what we can as, as school communities to encourage parents to get involved in, in their kids' lives. And it's gonna be difficult um 
However, it's integral that, that teens and parents work together to ensure their safety behind the wheel because uh, it's the parents that are the ones signing off on the liability uh, on the uh, on the driving permit. Um, and we want parents and we want kids to, to start out on, on the right foot with their, their driving career. Uh, so these are some of the, the successes uh, with parental involvement. Teens are 30% less likely to talk on a phone while driving. They're half as likely to speed, which is a big deal. 70% less likely to drink and drive and twice as likely to wear seat belts. All that because parents are, are involved. They're sitting in the front seat, uh, seeing what their, their kids are doing. Um, another thing, I, I show a video, um, it's uh, the Prom Night Zero Fatalities video, it's an awesome one, it's incredibly awkward, um, but uh, the dad comes in, he sits down, maybe? All right, well, see if we can get our video back. Um, but uh, dad comes in and uh, he sits down and uh, he's like, hey, Chris, my only, my daughter only dates responsible drivers, you know, buckle up. And uh, he doesn't break eye contact the entire time. And so I, I talk to these kids about, you know, when they're driving with their parents, their, you know, hands 10 and two or nine and three, seatbelts are on, they're driving the speed limit, music is down low, they're, they're focused. You get your license and all that goes out the window. So I encourage them like, hey, drive all the time like your parents are sitting in the passenger seat. It uh, you know, may not always happen um, that your parents are there, but try to drive like that. If you drive like your mom and dad are gonna be there, you're gonna be a safer driver. This isn't gonna be as much fun without uh, the screen, but uh, we talk about um, some of the top crashes in, in uh, speeding or sorry, top uh, crashes and citations that we, we issue. Speeding is the, the number one thing that we uh, deal with uh, with teens. Um, they get again, they get that freedom. They they want to feel the, the wind in their hair or whatever. Um, we stop a lot of kids. So I'll tell you a story uh, about a a young man that I stopped one night, it was probably ooh, five or six years ago. Um, I uh, was working in Spanish Fork one Friday night and it was a little after midnight. And uh, I just stopped on the side of the road just waiting to talk to somebody. And uh, soon enough, car goes by me at 107 miles an hour. I'm like, I wanna talk to that person. So I pull out, get behind the car, pull him over, walk up, and it was a young man, he was 16 or 17 at the time. I said, good evening, Trooper Bishop of the High Patrol. I'm stopping you tonight because you're going a little faster. You're at 107 miles an hour, the speed limit is 70 miles an hour. He said, I know, but, and he gave me his excuse. Anybody have any idea what he told me? He was late to get home. All the kids, when I tell the story in the driver's ed classes, they're like, you're coming up with everything, but never come up with curfew. I'm like, do you guys not have a curfew? Is this like an antiquated thing? So he was, he was late to get home. I'm like, hey, no problem. I was a teen once. I've been late a time or two, been grounded for it. Do you have your a cell phone with you? He said, I do. I said, great. Can you call mom? Just let her know that you're going to be a little bit more late um, because you got pulled over. But while you're on the phone, let her know that you got, or you're getting a ticket for 107 miles an hour. It's going to cost you $530. You're going to have to go see a judge and your license is going to be suspended for at least a month because you just accrued enough points to have a one month suspension. His jaw hit the steering wheel and he was like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, that's what happens when you drive that fast. Um, I hope um, that he, well, I know he made it home safely that night. I, I hope I saved his life. Um, that's really what, what it's about. I could care less about giving tickets. It's not what I enjoy, but it's about saving lives and educating um, drivers on why they should why they are doing what they're doing and why they should change their behavior um with him it was a very expensive lesson i'm sure he's probably still grounded and still paying that ticket off but uh, it's about modifying that behavior uh, because if he got home that night it's like hey i just made it home from santa quinn in like 10 minutes i can do it again next time it's going to catch up to him and it's going to be 
a pretty uh, devastating consequence when it does. So, um, so yeah, I, I went home, went to bed, slept great. Um, but he, on the other hand, he had to, to deal with that. Um, the other things we, we deal with are st uh, failure to stay within your lane. Um, again, being attentive. And that's, again, a new driver thing. They're still trying to figure out how car steering wheels work and, and all that. But uh, let's try this one more time. That is my computer. Let's see. Sure. How are you? Sure. Looks for the audio visual department. Well, there we go. Now we just got to figure out where it's at. So if you go into your display settings. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, we're back. So, uh, failing uh, to stay in the proper lane. Again, that's an attentiveness issue, but also uh, learning how cars work and that you know we need to stay between those those lines. Um, disregarding traffic signs or signals. Most people stop at stop signs and they stop at stoplights because they're paying attention. Uh, when they are distracted or have their attention elsewhere, that's when we see those those issues. Overcorrecting again that's just an experience issue that's why we have the 40 hours with mom and dad that's why we have range time uh, with with you guys and failing to yield and then finally uh, driving distracted uh, a couple weeks ago we did a distracted driving blitz in utah and uh, salt lake counties i was fortunate enough to be in our unmarked van that we used and uh in utah county alone uh, we had 90 just out of the the van uh, with our, our motor officers and i think it was close to 200 that weekend uh, in just a, a few short hours distracted driving is a huge huge problem um we last year we did the same thing we stopped a guy he was in a tesla and he's like and he's got his self-driving mode while he's reading the newspaper i'm like dude and he's he told the uh, the trooper who uh, stopped him he's like well i have the safe driving mode well that the self-driving mode rather i'm like well that's great but just well, over the weekend i saw some tesla in a self-driving mode ran into an airplane um the technology is awesome but it's not perfect we have to be able to maintain control of our, our vehicles that's what i tell people when they crash in the snow when they're driving too fast you have to be able to maintain control and you have to maintain a control of your vehicle no matter the technology that you have so a lot of people always want to know how much tickets are, are going to cost. So here's a quick breakdown. Most traffic uh, violations are between 100 and 160 dollars. Seat belts right now are 45 dollars. I'd love to see that fine quadrupled because I don't think people take 45 dollars serious. I think they look at it. Eh, okay, I guess I don't get to go out to dinner tonight. Um, if it was more, I think people would would care a whole lot more about it. And that's the single most important safety feature in our vehicle. Um, but yet the fine is $45. So use of a handheld device is $100 for the first offense and jumps up to $690 uh, for the second offense. Or if you are involved in a crash because you uh, were texting or, or using your phone, it, that's gonna be the first offense fine. That's a huge fine. I don't know why we can't do that with, with seat belts. So speeding is a lot different. It's more of a, a graduated scale. So you start at 130 and you get down to, to 480. So um, just next week, yeah, next, uh, the end of next week, um, two uh, new provisions go in, into effect. So Senate Bill 53 that passed this last session um, changes the this reckless driving law to, uh, or amends it to uh, 105 miles an hour or greater, falls into an automatic reckless driving, which hopefully is going to be a great thing. Um, over Easter weekend in Juab County, we had over 55 driver stop for uh, 100 miles an hour just in Juab County. That is insane. Um, I'd have to look, but I think on the year we're close to 2000 just, just this year for drivers stopped by the high patrol for over 100 miles an hour. 
So along with the automatic reckless driving at 105 plus, over 100 miles an hour, uh, you, the fine is gonna be 150% of the, the maximum. So at 480, uh, it's gonna be another 150% uh, of that. But with, four, with the 31 plus, there's two other things that happen that I talked about with, with that young man. It's $10 for every mile an hour over 31. Um, so in his case, he was um, 107, so he, uh, he was 36 miles an hour over the speed limit, or 37 rather. So he had another $60 tacked on to, to his fine. Um, so we, we have those two new tools that hopefully are gonna get speeds under control um, because it is absolutely crazy out there with the speeds that drivers are, are going. So a lot of kids will ask, well, what do I do when I get pulled over? Hopefully the traffic stop will go something similar to this. Sorry, we're gonna have to start it over. I forgot I'm muted. So as much as I would love to, to actually pull that one off, don't think, um, I don't think it'd, it'd fly, but uh, traffic stops, and I already told you, I don't love giving tickets. I, I'd rather stop people and have an educational opportunity with them. But uh, you know, that's exactly what we, we use traffic stops as. Uh, you know, even if it does come with, with a ticket at the end, um, the reason we're stopping them is to change, change their, their behavior. So um, what, do we, what do we need to do when you get pulled over? First thing is stay calm, take a deep breath. It's not gonna be the end of the world. Um, you'll, get, you'll get through it. So a lot of times um, these new drivers, well, really any driver, not necessarily a new driver, they will you know, immediately try to get to the side of the road as soon as we get behind them. Uh, I've seen some crashes, I've seen a lot of near crashes happen uh, because of that. We need to safely move to the right, uh, slow down and get to the turn your signal on, move, move to the right hand shoulder and then come to a stop. Next, we need to stay calm. Roll your windows down, especially if they're, they're tinted. We wanna see what's going on inside the car. Uh, it just makes our, our job safer and, and easier when uh, we can see what's going on. Stay calm, wait for us to come up and talk to you. Stay calm, follow our instructions. Um, if a lot of people have their registration or their license ready, or they'll wait for us, it doesn't matter to me. Um, it's just important that we're, we're seeing what's, what's going on inside the car. Uh, finally, we need to stay calm and not argue. That's what the courtroom is for. Um, I've never had anybody uh, talk themselves out of a ticket, but I've had plenty of people talk themselves into a ticket. Um, when you argue, 
and I haven't made my decision up, it kind of tips the, the scale um, to, to getting a ticket. It's not going to help anybody if, uh, if you're there arguing with us. And finally, um, take another deep breath. Again, we're going to get through it. Uh, it's just a ticket. It's not the end of the world. Um, put your seatbelt on, put your signal on, and pull back into traffic safely. Um, right now, we're working with zero fatalities on a winter driving presentation to add to, uh, add to your program as well. Um, it's going to be very similar to the way the Truck Smart uh, program works. Uh, we're going to have some different videos interchain or intertwined with, with some information. So we'll go ahead and preview some of that. Um, it should be live sometime uh, next month. Um, and but, oh, so that's what I was going to talk about. I did some quick research when I was putting this together, and apparently there's a lot of people who move to Utah from places that are south and west of here. Uh, and it doesn't doesn't snow there and they don't know how to drive in the snow and so their kids come up here and they don't know how to drive in the snow either so this is hopefully going to be a tool that we can use to get these new students to to learn how to drive in the snow give them some some tips and some some tools and then hopefully have these activities that they're doing at home and mom and dad are watching and be like oh look at that that's how you drive in the snow so it's going to be a win-win for our out-of-state move-ins um and I do need to disclose that I am one of those. I've moved from California in 25th, or 2005, but I know how to drive in the snow now. So there's going to be six different uh, sections to it. Here in Utah, you need to be able to drive during all four seasons of the year. And when you're driving in the winter, you'll be faced with some unique conditions. But if you're prepared, you'll be able to stay safe when you're behind the wheel. First up, you need to make sure your car is ready before you go. Breaking down is bad in good weather and can be dangerous in bad weather. Check your vehicle's tires to make sure they're in good condition with plenty of tread and proper tire pressure. If your car's tires are worn down or aren't properly inflated, it can affect your ability to maneuver properly and can increase the likelihood of a crash especially on slick, snow-covered roads. Make sure your gas tank is full. If you get stuck in traffic or snow, you might need more fuel than you anticipated. Check your winter wipers and make sure your wiper fluid is full and made for freezing temperatures. And here's a good tip. If you're using your windshield wipers, turn on your headlights too. It'll help others see you in poor weather. Wear warm clothes. If something goes wrong and you get stuck, you don't want to be wearing shorts or flip flops. Keep the following items in your car. You might need any one of these when driving in the winter. Flashlight and extra batteries, toe straps and tire chains, ice scraper, jumper cables, snow shovel, blankets, water and non-perishable food, first aid kit, matches and candles, extra clothes including gloves. Before leaving home, check the driving conditions and the upcoming forecast. Safe drivers will be aware of the conditions and their driving safety lines. You can get updates from the UDOT traffic app, UDOT Twitter feed, UDOT traffic cameras, or your local news. If you see temperatures will be near or below freezing, be prepared for ice on the road. Clear all snow, ice, and frost from your windows, headlights, brake lights, and signals so you can see clearly and others can see you too. Give yourself plenty of time to clear out your vehicle and be prepared for slow moving traffic so you don't put yourself at risk of crashing. Smell left on top of your car can become hazardous during your drive. It may become dislodged and cover your windows or lights. It may also harden and fly off your vehicle, causing damage around you. driving in poor weather conditions, remember that you need to take it slow for ice and snow. The main cause of crashes in the winter is people driving too fast for weather conditions, so slow down. During a storm, stay attentive and reduce your speed. It is your responsibility to maintain control of your vehicle and be aware of what's happening around you. Eliminate all distractions so you can focus on driving safely. 
Watch for wildlife, as animals can be more active after a storm. Also, do not use cruise control during a storm. When the road surfaces and the conditions are constantly changing, you need to be in full control. Be aware of black ice and colder temperatures. Roads that seem dry may be slippery and dangerous. Take it slow when approaching intersections, off ramps, bridges, or shaded areas. These are common places you'll find black ice. Right under the speed limit if it's wet and snowy or icy. The posted speed limit is only for dry and ideal conditions. Accelerate slowly, brake gently, and don't turn too quickly. Poor driving conditions can cause a crash if these rules aren't followed. And remember, four wheel drive and all wheel drive can help you maintain traction and get you through heavier patches of snow, but neither will help you if you get to a dangerous spot or skid. Four wheel drive does mean four wheel stop. When it's wet, snowy, or icy, you need extra room to stop, so increase your following distance. Snow and slush can form ridges between lanes that can be slippery and cause you to lose control. Avoid these ridges when it's possible. You should always wear a seatbelt. The crash risk increases in bad weather, so buckle up every time. If you find yourself behind a snow plow, stay behind it. The road behind an active snow plow is safer to drive on. Don't assume snow plow drivers can see you. Stay at least eight car lengths behind the plow and watch for snow discharging debris. If you're in front of a snow plow, don't stop suddenly. So we've also partnered with icyroadsafety.com and have received permission to use one of their uh, one of their videos. We're not going to watch it because it's kind of lengthy, but uh, it's got really really good information uh, that we'll be using for this presentation as well. If it has, it will. So again, it kind of talks about you know what to do in the event of a slide, and uh, it should be a, a really good uh, good resource once that's all put together. So the other uh, topics would be what to do after a crash. And sorry, it's been a little slow. Uh, moving over, uh, something that we're obviously really passionate about because it's literally our, our butts out there. Um, in March, I uh, was called out to, to go help some the troopers in Utah County during a snowstorm. And uh, so I arrived on scene and uh, the fire truck was blocking half the, the road. And so I get there um, and uh, one of the fire guys comes up. He's like, man, this kid almost hit us. He, I don't know how he did it, but there was probably a space between me and that table. Um, there was the wall and the fire truck. He somehow split that gap, hit the rear end of another car and almost took out a whole bunch of firemen in the process. Um, so we, we really, really preach hard on on moving over when we when you see emergency lights. And then uh, finally, we'll wrap up with a, a review of what was taught. There's going to be a quiz to go with it. Um, nothing super hard, but just making sure they're they're paying attention and, and hopefully learning a little bit from uh, from the presentation. Uh, again, it'll be uh, available on Zero Fatalities sometime next month. And uh, yeah, we'll hope that it's a good resource that these kids can use. So some of the other things that, that I offer and that DPS and, and UHP offer, uh, we do the Adopt a High School program um, where we try to select six to eight schools per year um, where we spend a whole lot more time involved with, with them at, during lunchtime activities. Um, halftime activities during basketball season or, or different things like that, trying to promote uh, vehicle safe or driving safely. Um, at the beginning of the year, we'll do a seatbelt survey, and then we'll do another one at the end of the year to hopefully see that kids are wearing, wearing seatbelts after they're learning why it's important to do so. I have a seatbelt convincer. 
uh, I have two of these. Um, they're based out of Salt Lake, but I'm happy to, to bring them around the state uh, if, it, uh, if it makes sense to do so. Um, we'll do driver's ed presentations. Our goal is to get into every single high school in the state um, to, to present our message. Um, if I'll give you my contact info here at the end. If you know, you're not being visited, reach out to me. We'll figure out who, uh, who we can get to your school um, because it's that important that we want to get into every single school and, and reach every single student in the state of Utah. I also have these pedal carts with distracted driving goggles or the drunk goggles that we've, we've all seen um, that I'm happy to, to bring to different events. And then not that this has anything to do with the driver safety, we also are happy to come to your community events during the summer. Uh, we do parades and, and all sorts of fun events with our, some of our older cars. Um, we have a great partnership uh, with, with UDOT, DPS, uh, Zero Fatalities, the Highway Safety Office, and, uh, and all of you. Uh, you guys are, are the most important uh, facet in, in these kids' lives when it comes to, to driving. You're the ones that are, are out there teaching them every single day, and I, I really appreciate the work that you do. Uh, my contact information is up here. Um, feel free to email me, call me, uh, send me a text if you, you have questions or if you'd like to get someone to your school to, to do a presentation. Uh, we will do our best to, to get there. Are there any questions or comments, something that I can do better or something you'd like to see us do? Okay, well, again, I appreciate your time uh, coming this afternoon and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.